Welcome to the MRMCD Day 4. Today, topic of the next talk will be Rust in Li Linux Kernel a status check. Welcome, Chris. Chris. Chris, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, so, yeah, hello, welcome to my talk. Um, maybe for me, uh, that I know what my audience is. Who has already coded in Rust? Okay. Who has coded in C? Who has compiled a kernel? Who uses tabs? Spaces? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so, um, this is what our talk will be. Ah, yeah. Um, this is a, a sign I have in my at home. I somehow found it on something like eBay Kleinanzeigen, and I thought it would be really fun that. Um, it's like a German saying, wer rastet, der rastet. So <laughs> I think <laughs> it's a nice sign. So that's our plan for today, what we want to do. Basically, um, we want to look at the, at the differences of um, writing Rust in user space and writing it in kernel space, what sufferings you have to do there, what the advantages are of using Rust in the kernel, um, how to compile your first driver or how to port a driver from C to Rust, what you have to think about. Um, yeah, how to add C bindings so that you can call C functions and how you can get involved into this project. A small disclaimer, um, I'm, or yeah, who am I uh, presenting this to you? I'm an electrical engineer turned programmer. So I'm mostly working with embedded devices. Um, Usually C, sometimes C++ is my language of choice, but I also um, am sometimes a kernel hacker um, sending code to mainline. Like, but, so that's my interest in the Linux kernel and Rust. Yeah, it, everybody keeps telling me that's the future and I tried it out and I agree. So that's why <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk about it. So. I'm not associated with the Rust for Linux project. I'm just Rust curious. And um, yeah, so, and I know I need uh, deadlines to start something. So I started a blog in order to get into this topic because otherwise I would never do something. So yeah, basically this talk is anything, everything that is also written in this blog. So if you don't understand something or you want to read it again, you can just visit this blog. Um, so yes, let's start with the technical part. So what's, what's the biggest um, difference? Basically, if you ask what is different for Rust in the kernel space, it's a similar question like what is different um, when you write Rust code for an embedded system or for a microcontroller? Um, there's just some things you don't have. For example, your embedded system might have special memory requirements, so you need um, your own allocator. Yeah, you need to write your custom allocator. Um, you don't really want to fail when you're allocating memories or you don't want to crash because it basically means you have to go restart your embedded system from zero again. It's not like in user space you write something, your program fails, you restart it again. Um, so what I saw in the Linux kernel, at least in the beginning, is um, the way it is integrated, like the Rust language is integrated in Linux kernel is you can find most of the relevant stuff only like in the directory Rust kernel. So basically they took whatever was in the GitHub repository of Rustlang and just copied it over and then removed stuff which is not doable relevant to the kernel. So now we come to the suffering part. So why is it maybe less comfortable to write Rust code for the kernel besides the fact that when you crash and you do it on your own computer, you basically have to restart your computer again. Um, you also don't have a st standard library because, yeah, for example, if you use a glibc, you do an alloc, what is happening? It's forwarded to the operating system, which allocates memory for you. Um, well, you're programming the operating system. Um, you don't have crates, you cannot use cargo build, cargo run, cargo add, whatever. 
Um, so any crate you want to use, basically, you have to port it yourself. Um, yeah, so the kernel is basically like one big program running on your computer. Basically, you have access to like what your driver has access to, also your scheduler has access to your crypto and unit, whatever. Like it's one big blob of data. So, so in TLDR, so you take this user space program, you want to port it to current states. What, what do you have to do for that? First thing is you remove everywhere where it's written standard colon colon and replace it by core colon colon or kernel. Like the core um, crate use can still use, but not standard lib. Um, yeah, you cannot just rely on um, crates being available for you. Like if you need a hash map or something, you have to implement it yourself or hope that some nice person already implemented it for you, not depending on standard. But even like libraries we like I needed at some point or I wanted a hash map and there's hash brown for embedded systems, but um, still there, I couldn't just directly use it for the kernel because at least the one I looked at still used standard for some reason. Um, then you don't have, yeah, um, that's not Rust specific, but like in general, if you write for the kernel space, you don't have standard in, standard out. So if you wanted to port your user space program to the kernel space, um, you would use other ways to interact with the program. That could be, for example, for output, usually the kernel um, gives you a way to configure your driver over the sysfs um, or procfs for counters and statistics. But I mean, the most, the best way probably to do it to create a character device and use the input and output functions that you have to implement yourself or the IO control um, calls. Then, yeah, again, um, allocations may fail. So you cannot just create a vector or if you want to create a vector from another vector, you can't call collect. You have to call try collect and then check the return value, whether it was successful or not. Basically, when I program Rust in user space, I kind of believe that I can always create a vector and it will not fail. I have infinite memory, but that's not the case in kernel space. Then another thing which is yeah, somewhat Rust specific or not, um, Usually for printing strings, you would use println um, in Rust user space. Then when you go to kernel space, you have different functions you would use, um, like PR info, PR warn. So depending on the verbosity you want to print later, you can filter for that. So in C, that would be um, printf. You would instead uh, write printk for kernel print um, in kernel space. And then currently, most of the kernel is still written in C. So at some point, you will have to interact with C functions, which already exist, in order to make your uh, get your program running. And yeah, for that, you will, if the bindings do not exist yet, you need to create them yourself. Yeah. So yeah. So when you port your user space code program, you do, do all that. And that's not an exhaustive list. I mean, that's the problems I encountered. But probably there will be other problems that can come up in your case. But um, let's generally talk again about why we want to have Rust code in the Linux kernel or why I wouldn't mind have it, having it in there. Um, so. Well, I guess you guys already know that, but like a short summary. With Rust, using Rust, you can basically um, extinguish a whole error class. Like um, you don't have buffer overf overflows or memory leaks or race conditions anymore, because that's basically made impossible by the language constructs. Um, yeah, the way the code is written. Because every time you use a variable, you explicitly mark it as mut mutable or not when you pass it to a function. So you know basically when I pass a mutable um, variable to my function, 
it can be altered if it's not mutable, and I try to alter it, the compiler will scream at me. Yeah, so type safety is another thing. Like, after I wrote Rust for a month I came and came back to writing C, I felt like a savage having to distinguish valid return values, like, for example, how many characters have been printed uh, versus is this an error or not. Like, in Rust, it's clear. You have an error uh, or result type, and you can unwrap it to either a result or an error. Like, there's no guessing game of is one error or not. So the interface is much clearer. Then also I found out the code size, and I will show an example about it later, is quite a lot smaller um, in Rust. So basically it's also more readable because you don't, yeah, you have, don't have so much clutter in your code. Um, this is, again, uh, not relevant for the kernel, but in general Rust, um, you don't have runtime dependencies because everything is statically linked which can be nice, but I mean, it can also lead to bigger binary sizes, which is not super relevant now to the kernel because everything is one blob anyways. Um, the standard lib is more extensive than the uh, glibc, for example. I was really happy how I can apply pattern matching or use lambda functions or something like that in Rust. So basically it feels like a more modern programming language instead of the abstraction over assembly code that C is. <laughs> and yeah, you have Cargo as a dependency manager. Um, in C, you have to take care of your dependencies yourself. Um, now let's come to the disadvantages of using Rust. Like, I think it's still work in progress, but compile time is still higher when you compile Rust code. And coding time is much higher. So basically, you spend a lot of time fighting the borrow checker, but at least once you, the borrow checker tells you, hey, everything fine, you can be sure the usual bugs are not on your code, you kind of did it right. So basically you can decide whether you want to spend your time longer coding or at the same time writing C code and debugging later. Um, but also, um, it feels like Rust is a more extensive language. It has more abstractions, more f features. C is quite compact, small. Like basically everything is either, is at the same time a pointer, a number, a character, whatever. It's all the same. And in Rust you have to learn and understand more. And I sometimes feel if somebody writes, uh, there's a way um, to write Rust code where it's not so easy to understand what is written. I feel C code many times is more readable or easily readable. But yeah. So yeah, this is for example the same code written in Rust and C. And that's what I meant by it's easier readable and less code overall because you have the question mark operator which basically um, yeah, forwards any result from, a, or if there was an error, this error will be propagated to the calling function and then you have the second function call which returns the value when you don't put a semicolon. While in C, for every function call, I mean, you can be a lazy programmer and just leave it out, but normally you should always check the return value of each function, and with Rust this kind of happens implicitly. And yeah, and then again, it has to be written in the documentation whether the int that my driver function returns is what value is considered an error, which one is not. Like, it can easily lead to type confusion. But enough um, bashing on C. <laughs> um, so what do you need to do if you want to write your first Rust kernel module today? So I would recommend to you cloning the Rust for Linux um, repository because it has more examples. Um, it has more sample modules. Sometimes you find um, yeah, things 
more things are implemented there. And even if they don't make it mainline, you kind of get a better idea where things are going. Um, after you clone it, you have the directory documentation, um, documentation Rust, and that's where, or in documentation in general, in the Linux kernel, that's where you find all the instructions, how to get started with things, or, yeah. The quick start, quick start guide is quite good to tell you what to do, but um, this is the command line I have to call in order to compile um, modules, Rust kernel modules. So I have to export a lot of things. It might not be relevant for your system. I just wrote down what worked for me. Yeah. And then when you compile um, or you use the Linux kernel uses the make um, system. So everything is done with make. Make um, menu config, make modules, or just make to compile the kernel. So there's also a command um, which tells you whether your system is ready to compile Rust code. Like you just call make Rust is available, which is the same as calling the script Rust is available dot sh. So basically, if you see the line, Rust is available, you're ready to play around. Yeah. But yeah, again, whatever is in Rust uh, for Linux, it's not stable. It's not mainline. It's just, well, it could be in mainline as well, but inherently it's not uh, what you will find there. Um, okay, config Coemo, I don't know how that got uh, there, but I would recommend using Coemo if you play around with kernel code in general. Because your other possibility is having an embedded board, and there you're running Linux. That's a possibility you interact with it over a serial interface. But Coemo is much easier, I would say. So, because then you can boot your newly generated kernel, um, load the, um, the kernel modules, unload them, and if it crashes, you basically just restart it. I mean, if you like suffering, you can do it on your private PC, but. Don't complain to me later. <laughs> um, so best case, you somehow get a minimal kernel config, which basically has a serial interface enabled. So you can see what is happening during the boot. Some file system, so you can yeah, have a home and put your compiled uh, modules there. Or you can make, make dev config, for example, to create a default config. Because the bigger your config, the longer time you will spend compiling. And basically, if you just want to play around with Rust, the smaller, the better, right? Then um, you do, you call make menu config and um, enable Rust as a feature first. And then you can decide what else you want to enable. For example, there is config um, Rust samples or something where you can have a print K example or in Rust for Linux, I think there was also a minimal character driver example. Yeah, so you have to enable that, whatever you want to compile, call make for creating the kernel, and make modules to then create the modules that you just wrote, maybe. Then you boot into Quemo, and then um, insmod, insert module, uh, remove module to load and unload the modules. And then in best case, you have something like um, an init function which writes, hello, I'm the module, and then an exit function which is called an unload of modules, which says bye-bye module or something. That would be, could be a good first um, project. So yeah, um, let's go through the code changes you would have to do or configuration changes you would have to go um, do in order to create new code. For example, let's assume you want to add a file driver for a rock chip. Um, or you want, for example, to... There is already a, already a rock chip driver. You want to port it to Rust, from C to Rust. Um, first, you need to enter into kconfig, the config option, uh, where, for example, bool, and then um, the bool means you can either enable it or disable. You can also put tree state to have the possibility to, to enable as it as a module, for example. Then the name of your driver, then what it depends on. Like, obviously, it will depend on the abstraction, um, the Phi platform driver 
gives you. Yeah. And a small help description for people to yeah, know what, what they're activating. And then you also need to edit the make file um, to make it possible yeah, to compile your driver. Um, the reason it's done like that, you don't want to have both .ko files or kernel module files um, on your system, because if they are both loaded, they basically match on the sa same device IDs. So they will basically be fighting for the same device to be the driver and tell, I am the driver, no, I am the driver. Um, yeah. So you want to make it mutually exclusive. So, and that's where you start actually writing your Rust kernel module code. Um, similar to C drivers, if you have seen it, um, that's basically a declarative macro um, for your kernel module, where you declare the name of your driver, who the author is, a small description, and the license, which is yeah usually there for each um, kernel driver, and the device table, which does the mapping between um, device ID and driver. And then next step would be to implement the driver trait. Um, so this is, yeah, this is the description which driver is associated with uh, which device ID. And basically what you can see is the C code and the Rust code are quite similar, right? Both of them uh, use this flag value. Both of them use the phi ID mask and the uh, yeah, phi ID for which this driver will be used for. They both have yeah the name. So if you have a driver porting it to Rust, if the infrastructure is already in place, is quite simple. Um, yeah, so I, for example, played around trying to port this Rockchip driver. Um, and in January 2024, at least, the function genfi config annex was not exported yet. So I had to add um, this function in the phi.rs file um, where the bindings come in place. Basically, what we see here is we initialize the Rust struct device with the C struct phi device um, through bindings. And then we can access the, the raw pointer to phi device by calling self.0.get. Um, then I saw in the code, which is already um, yeah, in mainline, that there's always a documentation which, which, which starts with safety and which tells why it is assumed um, safe to use FIDEF, for example, or this pointer. Yeah. Why it is assumed to be safe to do the call. This is even a like Ah, nice, nice, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then also, this function will encapsulate um, this unsafe function call through the function to result into um, a type that Rust will understand. So from this int value, because there's a standard in uh, the C code, what is an error, what is not, um, this int value will be transformed into result of value or error. So basically, everything that's outside of unsafe, all the Rust code should be safe if this expectation is met. Um, but obviously, the Rust compiler cannot give you any guarantees for whatever is happening in the C functions. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, I had those two drivers. Um, so we can see that the rockchip.c driver, the original driver, has 200 lines of code, while the thing written in Rust would be 131 lines of code. Um, I'm not good at math, but like 30% less code or something, 35.3, I don't know. Um, and then in this case, the Rust kernel driver was even smaller than the C 
uh, kernel driver, but um, I also had a case where this was the reverse. Um, I never tested this driver because I didn't have a rock chip board to try it out, but I mean, it compiled, so it's Rust, I would say just ship it, right? <laughs> <laughs> now what happened is actually I, um, I sent it mainline to the kernel mailing list and I got a valid response of um, we don't need yet, like they, there was already um, one Phi driver which is available as C code and Rust code and they said one driver is enough as an example and I actually agree. So the next person who writes another Phi driver can decide whether they want to write it in C or in Rust but like you don't need Rust drivers for stuff that exists in C already. But it was a nice uh, experience for me. Um, so then let's talk about C bindings and FFI, the foreign function interface. What is it for? Who doesn't know what it's for? Oh, I can just skip over it. No. <laughs> so basically, um, bindings or the foreign function interface is there to have an interface between two functions. Well, you call a function which exists only in C from your Rust code and the FFI abstracts differences away. Like for example, um, this, the C bindings make sure that um, the arguments which are passed to the functions conform to the C calling conventions. Um, yeah, for example, the struct fidef is, yeah, I think a pointer or something. And integers can be different on different platforms. So C int is used in Rust to make sure, or bindgen makes sure that um, the right size for the integer is selected. It basically converts the data types between the two languages and does the cleanup after calling the functions. Yeah. And also um, it makes sure that like some calling conventions expect arguments to be on the stack, others in registers. Um, so yeah, bindings make sure that the abstraction um, it, yeah, abstracts it away for you. And this can also change between different compiler versions. So basically you always have to recompile the bindings um, yeah, when you change compiler. So that's how it looks like in the code. So basically, um, bind gen is used to create those bindings and it uses libclang to parse the C or C++ headers. And it generates Rust code, which you can then directly call, where this Rust code then calls um, the C functions. Yeah. And in the bindings helper.h file, um, what you find is mainly include. So basically anything that is, for example, um, in phi.h in this include file will be then later represented in the bindings generated.rs file as wrappers, Rust wrappers around C functions. And helpers.c is, for example, useful for macros. Something like is air, is, which is a macro, which yeah, um, checks whether an error occurred or not. Macros you cannot directly put in bindings, so you have to wrap them in functions. And you will find them in bindings, helpers, generated.rs. Yeah, so this would be the inside view. That's what I meant. Like phi.h, this header, for example, has the struct gen phi c45 driver. And um, also the, the function um, gen. 10g config anic and uh, those will be wrapped in extern C. So the first one is basically a mutable global variable which you then have access to and the second one is the global function which you can use from Rust. And you can use it as if it was written in Rust, um, this function call. Yeah, and yeah, the, the bindings also take care of, for example, name mangling and memory layout um, and calling, yeah, calling convention, I already said. Because C, yeah, we know, for example, C use directly fun function names. You can, if you call strings on the symbols, you can directly see it. And C++, for example, has this very 
monst monstrous construct of encoding also what kind of parameters are taken by the function in there. So Rust um, functions look like C++ function. Um, yeah. And, but all those functions you want to call, you always have to put them in, um, in unsafe. Um, to encapsulate in unsafe because again, those are C functions you call, so you cannot make sure like, uh, that the function will not crash or something. Yeah, and this one would be the macro is error is a C macro and the bindings make it possible that you can also call is error in your Rust code and get the same result. So basically from a bool in helpers.c, you also get this function which returns bool in Rust and takes a const void pointer. Oh God. Okay, last time, January 2024, that was still the case. Sorry, I'm not up to date. <laughs> At some point, this was the best uh, solution. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh yeah, and yeah, if you ever wanted to debug then whether your binding was actually generated and you can use it because maybe in your code it's not found, um, you can just do like call strings um, and see whether a symbol is um, in the file or yeah, in exports core generate dot h. You can yeah check whether your binding was exported. But I was a bit su surprised that C++ ca could understand the mangling scheme of Rust. Yeah. So then what is the current state of the kernel? What can you actually do? And that's where it gets a bit sad. <laughs> um, so in the newest version I looked at, basically in terms of device drivers, what you could write, you could write block device drivers. Then there's the module device. So general devices are already integrated, but like not specific devices, which would be more useful. Like usually you don't want to use the struct device directly, but instead have already a platform driver, which abstracts away for you USB drivers or um, serial drivers. Yeah. So, and uh, for example, it looks nice that there's a module for net, but if you look into it, it basically only in integrates platform drivers for FICE. <laughs> so there's not much happening yet, but I'm sure it will take off at some point. Yeah, and also if you look at um, what is already available in mainline in terms of drivers, you have rnull, which is a block driver. So basically uh, what you would get with devnull, that's already implemented. Then besides this Example AX8879 6B Rust driver. There is one new file driver which was added, QT 2025. And yeah, so a Kazan test. So basically, yeah, it is not as developed as we all would like to, I guess. But yeah. So, what are my lessons learned from, well, mm, eight, nine, nine months, ten months of trying to understand um, what is happening in the Linux kernel in terms of Rust support. So I learned basically that there are basically no subsystems um, or approaching no subsystems which have bindings for coding your uh, Rust kernel modules yet. Um, also, it is interesting how much the standard lib helps you and makes, yeah, makes your life easier, basically. Even something like vector collect is not implemented as per se, because yeah, vector, you need to basically allocate memory. So um, you cannot just use whatever is in the standard lib, you have to write your own thing. Um, so yeah, and also um, if you want to implement a trait, you cannot do it in a third file in Rust. Like for example, um, the trait 
driver for the struct, I don't know, a file driver, you can you have to do the implementation implementation for your file driver either in the dot rs file which defines the trait or the struct, but you cannot have it in a third file that is prohibited by the compiler, I think. Okay, create create boundary because if you load in a third create, it will not know which function to use if it they both implement it. Um, so basically, that's why in the kernel you have to always, yeah, they are using a vec ex, ex I don't know vec ex um, struct to encapsulate vec, and I think that will be used for many of the basic strict, um, structs we are used to in the standard lib. Um, furthermore, the C, C API makes no promises. Like if you write a Rust function, you can basically already in the function name and parameters, you can already see what is going to happen. Like if you pass a parameter as a mutable parameter, you know um, the ownership goes over to the function and they are in charge of freeing it, for example. Or, yeah. And in C, it's all just the same. You have to rely on the documentation that the maintainers wrote. Uh, and if it changes, you will hope that the maintainer then would change um, yeah, uh, the Rust code as well, which leads to um, what... I, as an outsider, have seen how the current um, argument is going be between Rust people in favor of Rust in the Linux kernel and maintainers. Like it's 10% a technical problem, 90% a social problem. Um, because as a platform driver maintainer, that's the best person who can actually provide the infrastructure for new drivers, right? But for that the person would have to learn Rust because they must understand this language well enough um, to ensure that it's secure what is written there. So if you're not fluent in Rust, let's say, then it's a bigger burden to do code review and you can yeah, not 100% sign that this code will be secure, for example. Yeah, but I mean, the, I guess if you are a kernel maintainer for 30 years and now those young folks come around and say Rust is the future, let's try that, you might not want to learn yet another programming language. Yeah, so for me this was the starting point um, of what kind of resources I found when I asked around how to get started with Rust in the kernel. So basically, the best starting point is rustforlinux.com. It has all the links, all the relevant links to all the re relevant platforms. You can also subscribe to the mailing list and get all the emails of changes that go in discussions. Um, yeah, I can recommend the GitHub repository. And it seems like the Rust for Linux people decided not to go for Slack or Teams or IRC or anything. They decided to go to Tulip. I did not know before what Zulip is. Maybe I'm just out of date. Yeah. And if you want to see some reference drivers, you can also go to the Rust for Linux website. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, that's overall my presentation. If you guys want to, we can also have a look at um, one of the file drivers, how it looks like in C and um, Rust. But other than that, let's maybe first start with questions. Do you have any questions? So when you the Wait. <laughs> we are live here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, could you maybe just go back to the slide with the uh, k-config that you showed for the file driver? Say yeah, stop. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. So, um, yeah, currently it says it depends on Rust, Filelib, etc. and Rockchip, Phi. Uh, that's great. Um, 
Hang on, there, there was another one where, uh, right, the make file. No, 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 that's no, the, make file. the make file. Sorry, sorry. Right. Yeah. So my question is, um, is there also like, or intended to be a global setting where you could say, I just take all the Rust drivers so that you could say like, uh, you know, if uh, config use everything in Rust? I don't know about it. But um, it's not <laughs> designed that there are two drivers. This is special cases where there are two drivers allowed. Usually you only have one driver. That's the problem where GCC IS is coming in because you can't currently compile Rust on every platform. I think it's only like three or four platforms that are actually implemented that can use Rust. But the end goal is to just then have the driver in Rust or in C, but not both. And so there's not really need for that. Yeah, and I can also imagine that you want to decide generally, like even if there are two drivers, you probably want to decide manually. I want this one in Rust and this one not in Rust. And I don't know. But yeah, I, I, I figure like this driver is just an example driver. And in the future, it will be in C or Rust, yeah. X or Rust. But we actually had that discussion at like kernel recipes, and uh, they also talked about it at uh, Plumbers when uh, you know somebody said, "Well, for like migrating code, like you know, over time, maybe we could have two implementations in parallel that people choose." But yeah, there's also the one driver that I think Danny Law, I'm not sure of the name right now, is implementing, where there is um, one C implementation and Rust implementation, but this is just logic. And the driver abstraction is still in C, uh, but that is still also work in progress. Yeah. I mean, the most useful things to rewrite in Rust are things that do some parsing, right? Like uh, eBBF filters or, I don't know, config parsers. Like, I don't actually think that um, drivers need to be the first place where Rust is in. But uh, there is one thing about USB that is Greg really, really happy about it. We talked about it at Kangreos um, with, with USB that you can have uh, also block devices um, and, and um, PCI devices where they use B devices or PCI devices that tell you wrong data. A SD card that has two terabytes, which is only two gigabytes actual size and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We are also rust with the untrusted that Banner wrote is of interest. Yeah. So basically anywhere you have complicated logic and user input is good. And you have to pass user input in the kernel for, mm. for example, or not user input, but, but device input and, and pass it how long is the, how big is the device and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Any other questions? Oh, back there. Uh, thank you for the talk. And um, yeah, I have a more like general question regarding the state of the implementations and so on. So uh, I have to disclaim I'm not super experienced, so it might be not on point in terms. <laughs> okay, but anyway, so I read recently that Android uh, now as well um, accepts Rust code for drivers and firmware and software and so on. So I wondered if there's like if this will actually help to get more tools available and um, might as well be uh, yeah, somewhat helpful in the progress here for these kernel tools and... I mean, the more Rust is used, the more tools will be developed, the more it helps Rust to advance. But I mean, there's also the argument to be made, maybe Rust doesn't need to be um, integrated into the Linux kernel, maybe it's time to create a new OS which will sub supersede Linux. That's one other possibility what might happen in the future. Ah, okay. Thank you. Any more questions? No questions? Then... Thank Chris for the talk. Thank you.